Council to order for Wednesday, December 14th, 2016. And I need approval of the agenda. Council McKay. I uh, recommend the Council <clears throat> adopt the agenda of the December 14th, 2016 special meeting of Council as presented. Mr. Scott, all in favor? First thing is new business. Uh, 3.1 in the Council procedure amendment bylaw number 634. I need uh, a Dr. Scott. The council hereby approve the final reading of District of Tumble Ridge Council Procedure Amendment Bylaw 643 2016. Second, Mr. Pat. Any discussion on that? Uh, the council, Mr. Thank you, Worship. So, just on that, so my understanding that in regards to uh, having some discussions is PPC and be first, and we're going to a regular meeting on the second meeting. So, my understanding is some things from the PP can come up and be voted on in that regular meeting session. Does that give enough time for some council to make sure they understand what's going for? Sometimes things come off the fly. We're going to be voting on it 20 minutes later. I think if we're uncomfortable with that, we don't we don't bring it to that that meeting. But then it's, again, it comes to majority. So majority agrees that they, we can vote on it. We vote on it. Mr. Wall. Uh, so if the topic hasn't been listed as an item in the regular meeting, it would take unanimous consent of council to add it to the agenda. What are you saying, though? If we discuss something and, and we want to vote on it in the, the regular meeting, so, okay. So if one one person doesn't feel that he's ready to vote on it, and then we'll come. that's correct, unless it's in the regular agenda already. If it's in the regular agenda already, it would be a regular normal vote. If it's not in the agenda already, it would be unanimous vote to bring it to the agenda. So we're gonna have two different agendas: one agenda for the PP and one agenda for that regular meeting that same night, or it's gonna be all one agenda. It'll be one agenda with topics within the PPC. So again, it would still be out where sometimes discussion in, 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 from other councils, all of a sudden something comes up and you're like, geez, I never thought of that. And we're gonna be voting on it. Or could it possibly vote on it? I have, a, I have a concern with that. I mean, even if I'm not ready and the rest is, like, obviously you can vote on it. If, if it's on the agenda, but we can't bring it to the agenda. So it's something that you're gonna know is gonna be on that agenda. Yeah. So I'm just saying that the discussion around the table on a PNP, can uh, all of a sudden you don't realize some ways and we're going to boss could vote on that instead of it taking a week or two weeks to come back and forth is all I'm saying. I was just going to say I voted in the negative to put to go forward with this and that's my concern too. Our PPCs are, are fairly lengthy and there's a lot of discussion on the items so I, I see our PPCs getting shortened even more and that's that's where we you know discuss a lot of things that are on the table. I, I feel that if somebody says they're not comfortable having it voted on that day, I think the rest of the council, we're, we're not going to force somebody to vote that they're not comfortable with it. If they want to look at it for more information. I mean, you got you to have to give some, you got to, your, your fellow council members, some of them have got to feel the same way. And I, I, I wouldn't force anybody to be on that. Uh, but just on that, I understand not being forced to vote, then I wouldn't vote. Yeah. But the rest of the council can still push that through, not having the time to think about it. Maybe there's things that come up. That's, that's my only concern is majority still rules, so that vote can still happen, even though I'm not prepared to vote. So, so how do you how do you want to? I don't know. I just, that's, that, that was just one of my concerns. I'm just bringing that forward. Mr. Wall, do you have any say to that? I would say the same as before. Within that PPC discussion part, you would be limited to the same things you would have before and when I was we have gone beyond the scope of what committee meetings should do uh, over the past two years so when we go to this style we'll limit the fact that PPC meetings only the only decisions that should be made in committee the whole meetings is that something gets forwarded to a regular agenda that's how it, it should work so there shouldn't be any decisions made in a PPC or committee the whole other than we want to forward this recommendation to a regular council meeting. So there should be no decisions happening in there. And so if you're forwarding something to the next council agenda, that would be done by a majority vote for the next council agenda. If it wanted to be on the same agenda as that committee discussion is on, you would need a unanimous consent of council to add it to the agenda. This is nothing new. I mean, it, like I say, we've done this in the regular 
district. And I haven't seen a problem, but it's, it's something we can try, and if it's not working, we can change it. You know, you know, we've talked uh, about um, different, different situations where a special meeting is required, and, and but but in this case here, with with being in a PNP, if we're not ready to bring it up to a regular meeting, it doesn't necessarily have to be brought up that particular night. If it means for future or for more discussion on it, I mean, I think that's that's still available. But am I correct in that? I think so. So nothing should go ahead unless everyone's comfortable yeah. with it, or or I guess consensus. I guess. Are you okay with that? Okay. Uh, all in favor? Opposed? Okay, uh, 3.2, 2017 Council Meeting Schedule. Council Scott? The Council approves the District of Temple Ridge 2017 Council Meeting Schedule as presented. And that staff advertise a schedule in the newspaper on the district website and other district notice boards. Council Guy, second. Any discussion? All in favor? <coughs> 3 point three KPMG for services review. So we're bringing that forward in, in open and then and again in closed. That's correct. Okay. Welcome, gentlemen. You'll have to introduce yourselves because I have nothing here. <laughs> Your Worship, uh, members of council, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Oscar Poloni. I am a partner with KPMG in our Northern Ontario practice in Sudbury. Joining me today is Chris Calder, who's a senior manager with our office in Prince George. And um, I'm going to apologize for a couple of things up front. First off, I'm going to apologize because I'm from Ontario. Uh, second of all, I'm going okay. to apologize because in some instances, the examples I will use are Ontario municipalities, not BC municipalities. And there are some differences between British Columbia and, and Ontario with respect to municipal legislation. So if I do get something wrong, please bear with me. The reason why I'm here is the District of Tumblr Ridge issued a request for proposal in April for a municipal service delivery review. And I've done a number of these in Eastern Canada, and I was requested by the Prince George office to assist them with this. So I have met you, Your Worship, my apologies, I did not know our last meeting. I haven't met members of council before, so just a bit of an introduction to myself. I've probably done work with 40 to 50 municipalities in the province of Ontario for a range of services. I will tell you, I am a small town municipal guy. My clients range from municipalities of your size, 2,500, 3,500 residents. One of my smallest municipalities has 400 residents. So I don't do work for Greater Toronto. I don't do work for Vancouver. I'm a small town kind of guy. And the purpose of my presentation today is to provide council with an overview of the draft report for the course service review for the district of Tumblr Ridge. I do want to stress the fact that this report is currently draft. And after we have this presentation, we will be circling back with individual members of council on a one-on-one -on -one basis to discuss the report, the findings, and the opportunities in detail. To be able to answer any questions that you may have, to be able to get your perspective on whether we've missed anything, to be able to get some sense as to whether you agree with what we've said or disagree with what we've said. So this, by no means is the end of the process. More than anything else, this is the beginning of the decision-making process. And that is a commitment that we make to all of our clients because at the end of the day, council calls the shots. We're very clear on that. So for the purposes of today's presentation, I just wanted to speak briefly about the review, the terms of reference and what we did. I'd like to talk about what we've identified as key themes. And what we find in these reviews is, is generally helpful and lump our major findings into broad categories to be able to capture them. Talk a little bit about the opportunities for consideration and then talk about implementation and next steps. And then your worship members of council, if there are any questions, that's part of the answer. So in terms of the review, 
As I've mentioned, the terms of reference was described in the request for proposal document that was issued by the district on April 22nd, 2016. Basically, it asked for three things. One was to talk about your municipality in terms of organizational structure, services, and service levels. The second is to talk about your operating effectiveness and efficiency based on benchmarking, best practices, and other tools. And the third one was to look for changes. Changes that could potentially save you money, changes that could potentially identify new sources of funding, address funding gaps, and also look at long-term financial sustainability. And I, and I will say, Council, one of the things that we also looked at was could you have potential changes to your process that will enhance the customer experience? And let me give you my example. I remember when I was registering for university, I got to stand in line behind 30 people at the registrar's office. And when I registered, I said, okay, I'd like to pay. And they said, no, you have to go to a different one. And so I stood behind 30 people and I paid my tuition. And after I paid, they said, okay, you have to go back into the first line and get some sense to, to give them proof that you've actually paid. And my response was, can't I stand in one line? And so what you often find when you do reviews like this is not only is there the financial aspect that comes up, but there's also the customer service aspect as well. And one of the examples we'll talk about in the presentation deals with exactly that. So what the RFP did in addition to outlining the objectives also outlined the deliverables and what was expected to come. So the first was a delineation of your services between those that you have to deliver versus those that are enabled, where you choose to deliver them yourselves. And this is often a big deal for municipalities because what you will find is the bulk of what you do, you have no choice. You have to do it because it's essential under um, legislation, either provincial or federal, or it's essential to run the organization. For example, under the community charter, you are required to have a corporate office. You have no ability to avoid that as well. You have to maintain the roads. What was also asked for, secondly, was to evaluate your operations, service delivery models, and level of services to look at where you could have potential opportunities or areas for improvement. Recognizing that every municipality has the discretion to set service levels the way you want. And some will be bare bones, where they offer a very minimal level of services, and some will be what I call not bare bones, where they offer now, the example people use is Cadillac versus Volkswagen, recognizing Volkswagens cost more than Cadillacs now. But there's that range that you have in place. The third is to look at your budget practices to get some sense as to how the approach is. Does it deal appropriately with financial sustainability? And the last point is to look at an implementation plan to talk about how do you move forward from opportunities to execution. And so those were the deliverables that were required under the RFP. In order to meet them, there's a series of steps that we did. We had an initial meeting with your CAO to confirm the whole point of the review, what you were looking for, what the outcomes were. We did have meetings with the members of district council to talk about your perspectives on municipal operations and potential areas for change, where you see areas for opportunity, where you don't. We've had opportunity to meet with your personnel, both at the management level and at the rank and file level, to talk about what you do, how you do it, why do you do it, and what would you change. And what we often find is people who know the jobs the best are the ones who do them. And so if you don't talk to them, you're going to miss on some of them. We've reviewed financial and non-financial documentation. We've looked at some other municipalities. We've looked at a list of opportunities for consideration. We've had your staff review the draft report in advance of release to council and we always do this because there's always stuff that we will get wrong and we are here tonight to present the draft report to mayor and council. The steps that we have to do is to come back and incorporate the feedback. And that's the feedback that we receive from council that says, could you look at this for us? I don't necessarily agree with this. My understanding of this is that so it's a bit of an iterative process and as I've mentioned this is the start I just want to reinforce once again that this report is not final. so in terms of key themes and we've identified these in the executive summary and expanded them on the report 
support, there's a number that we've identified. And the first one that I want to talk is I want to talk about the level of service that you provide and the cost that's associated with it. Now, council, I will confess my focus is on residential taxes. And the reason I focus on residential taxes as opposed to commercial taxes or industrial taxes is because generally speaking, residents are the ones who vote. Residents are the ones who express their concern. Now, I can appreciate that taxes are significant for the commercial sector. I will tell you this. When I'm not doing this, I'm an office managing partner. I supervise five offices. I have no idea what our property taxes are because the reality is, is they are way on the list down of what our costs are. I'm more concerned with personnel, bad debts, marketing expenses, that type of stuff. And that's why we focus on the residential taxes. When we look at your community, it's an interesting community. And once again, this is on the outside looking in because it's a planned community. It's a new community. It's also built for 10,000 people. And so what that means is this, is if I think about my clients that have 2,500 to 3,500 residents, they don't have your community center. When I think about communities of your size, they don't have paved trails. When I think about the communities your size, they don't have the extent of water services that you do. And a lot of your services and your service levels are actually driven by your infrastructure. Curling clubs, aquatic centers, restaurants, that type of stuff that's in the community complex, you wouldn't normally have that, or I would suggest to you a community of your size likely wouldn't have that, but you've already got it, so you've got one of two choices. Either you offer it or you shutter it. And what I would suggest is if you've got it, you might as well use it. Um, when we look at the discussions we had about public works with respect to garbage collection, my municipality that I live in is Machiavellian when it comes to garbage collection. If I don't have my bag on the street at seven o'clock, they won't come back and pick it up for me. And literally council, my house was the first house on the route. And what that means is at 10 to seven, when I walked outside, I could see the garbage truck parked on the side of the road. What we understand for Tubler Ridge, if somebody doesn't put their garbage out, your truck will turn around and go back and pick it up. And you can tell me that's not a lot of cost, but the issue is that's what your people are telling us, Councillor. Sorry, I know you're looking at each other. All right. And you can talk about what the cost is, but that's a service level. Your winter roads maintenance policy is what I would consider to be very generous and that you generally operate with a bare pavement policy. I will tell you, coming in here from Grand Prairie, I took the wrong route. It was anything but bare pavement. But the issue is this. There's no requirement for bare pavement. And in communities your size, typically what you find is they build up a snowpack first in or before they start to go down to bare pavement. And generally speaking, the reason why they do that, if I can be frank, is because they fill the potholes in the roads with snow. And so that way you don't notice the potholes you are down to a bare pavement policy, which is a fairly large investment in equipment and in time and efforts. It provides a superior level of service. The fourth area that we've talked about is the community grants. And inside your budget, there's approximately $750,000 of grants and fee for service. $341,000 for a library, $200,000 for a museum. You don't see this type of investment typically in municipalities of your size. I'm not saying it's something you may want to cut back on. I'm not saying it's something that you may not necessarily want to do. It's just a lot of places don't make that type of investment. When you look at how you compare to other municipalities, you can see this. The golf course and the restaurant, some people will argue that's a discretionary service. Some people will argue that's not core to a municipality. I would say that, except one of the comparators actually runs a golf course. So it does happen, but it's generally, in our experience, in the minority. Now, I mentioned your comparators, and what we've done is, and I will apologize for the small print on the screen, we've run a comparison of municipal operating costs on a per household basis for 2015. The province of British Columbia actually has a lot of detailed schedules on their website for all of the municipalities. And what we did was, including Tumblr Ridge, 
we tried to pick five municipalities. What we did was we tried to pick municipalities that were district municipalities. We weren't going to cities. We weren't going to different governance models. We tried to pick municipalities that were in northern BC because I can appreciate north versus south has a lot of differences in terms of economic conditions, affordability issues, the actual cost of doing operations. And you try to pick municipalities with comparable sizes. And what you will find is that your municipality is actually fourth from the left in all of these bars. You have the highest municipal operating costs per household. And what is driving that is very clearly your parks, recreation, and culture costs, which includes your complex that, as I discussed, and this isn't critical, this is just an observation, is likely overbuilt for a community of your size and your general government, which we understand includes the grants, which is likely over-invested for a community of your size. So what's interesting, though, is despite the fact that you have high service levels and an expansive range of service, it strikes us as being extremely cheap to, be, to live in Tumblr. The average municipal taxes are somewhere in the range of $600 per household. They've actually gone down <coughs> on a year-over-year -year basis. So in 2016, your residential taxpayers paid less than they did in 2015. And my comment to your CAO was, if I was the CAO, I would never let that happen. And it may sound brutal, but my comment is, is once people are used to paying for something, why would you give them the break? You can always find money to put it in from a reserve perspective. And the reason why you have this, and you're aware of this, is because you continue to generate significant amount of taxation from non-residential customers. What some people will say is that there's cross-subsidization that's happening, where you're using non-residential tax base to subsidize the true cost of municipal services for residents. And I would suggest that's the case. I would suggest that for the level of service you're providing, your residents are not paying the full cost or what they would normally pay in this scenario. And so if I can give you one example, and I'm once again, I apologize it's an Ontario example, but there's a community in Smooth Rock Falls, which is located in eastern Boreal Forest since 1912, they used to have a craft paper mill owned by Temba. And everything was good. They would plow the streets, and then what they would have is they'd have a municipal employee in a pickup truck drive behind and clean out the end of the driveways because they didn't want people to have to clean out their driveways. And the reason why they could do this is because they had the mill. The mill built from the arena, the mill paid 20% of the municipality levy and all of that stuff. And then what happened? was, as British Columbia is aware, the softwood tariff dispute broke out and the provincial forestry sector in Ontario was just decimated. So in June of 2006, Tembeck basically told all of the employees, don't come to work, we're on temporary shutdown. And then in December 2006, what they told people was, go find another job because we're closing it down permanently. And then in Ontario, because it's an assessment-based tax, much like BC, why would you pay tax on an empty building when you can pay tax on vacant land? So in February 2007, they tore the mill down. And the town basically lost 20% of its budget. What they discovered was they were charging their residents $600 a year for taxes. If you drive 20 minutes in either direction, municipalities were charging $1,200. And that is the concept of that subsidization speak to the mayor, very nice fellow, his comment was, if I could go back in time, I would have charged him 1200 bucks back then, because that's the true value of the service. You have that here, and, and in a lot of respects, and this is where I found it different from Ontario and BC. In Ontario, anything that's underground is not taxed. So, like, this is a new experience for me. You have the benefit of continuing to generate that taxation revenue, despite the fact that you don't have to provide the services, you don't have the workers in the town. But you need to recognize that what this does is this camouflages it. And you know, people will say to me, Poloni, 
this is the perfect scenario. And it absolutely is. You have very high service levels and very low taxes. And your average residential tax rate is so low that in some cases it's actually less than the grant that people get to pay their taxes. So they make money. So there's that there's that disconnect. And it's it's very appealing for the municipality. It's great from an affordability perspective. Your residents are probably quite happy. I will just tell you in 25 years of working with municipalities, large and small, I've never seen this. And so there's can a I, disconnect. Can I just interrupt you for Please. a minute? Um, I know we're going into code, and I've got some comments and some questions. I just wonder how, how is it, it's the financial questions and stuff that are, and should we be asking them right here in, in, in the open meeting or? or uh, we should be waiting to vote. Uh, financial questions around where you want to set your tax rates is, is open conversation. Yep. Uh, do, when, how did you want to handle the question? Um, your worship, I'm not in a rush, so we could have questions during the presentation or we could wait to the end. It's your meeting and I will defer to your choice. I was just going to say, it'd be nice if we could stop the meeting and get Trent to come in here and listen to what these guys are saying and put that in the paper for us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know who Trent is. So. He's our local reporter guy. Yeah. Just kidding. <laughs> okay, well, one of the questions I got, and it's a comment, I guess, more than a question, is that we're, we're, we're a community that was built here to service two miles. And uh, we've been lucky in the way that we've been getting taxes out of these even though they're not operating. In my, my view, and, I, and I, I know I agree with everything you just said, but my view is that we take, we tax the mines because they, they don't put a whole bunch back in this town, and we kind of give it back to the, the people by, by way of, of the rec center, and the rest of the rec center at a loss, and stuff like that. And I don't think that's wrong. Through you, your or to you, your worship. A um, couple of couple of points that I'll make. One is, I don't believe any arena should pay for itself through user fees. I think you should operate at a loss, and the reason why is because if you make arenas recover their full cost through user fees, only rich kids will skate, and that fundamentally is unfair. The the second comment that I will make is. And, and I hate to say this because I know it's going to sound weird, you're actually better off with the mines being closed from a purely financial perspective because you continue to get the taxes, but you don't have the people who need the services. Which is why you're in the situation where you're in with $27 million of reserves. If you move 10,000 people into this community because the mines open, you're still collecting the same amount of taxes from the mines you'll get a bit more from the residential property tax holders, but your costs are gonna go from nine million a year to three million. And that's, and that's why you actually have that disconnect. I'm not necessarily saying what you're doing is wrong. Um, I'm not saying it isn't what residents would want. My only comment to you, your worship and council, is this. Think about what your day's like. If you're like me, first thing you do you get up in the morning, you go to the washroom. Dirty water goes away, clean water comes back. You take a shower, brush your teeth. You don't have to worry about the quality of the water because you know the municipality is running it. It's garbage day. I put garbage out on the curb. I come home, it miraculously disappears. I'm able to drive to work because somebody has plowed the roads. My son has to go to parks and recreation program. So I take him to the arena, there's ice time, all of that stuff. If my house catches on fire, I call the fire department. When I come home, you know, at the end of the day, what's the last thing you do? If you're like me, you go to the washroom. Dirty water goes away, clean water comes back. Everything that you do touches members of your municipality. From the moment they get up to the moment they go to bed, in the case of fire protection, even when they're asleep. My only point, Your Worship, is there is value to that service. And right now, you're not charging for it. 
You don't have to charge for it. But what you need to recognize, counsel, with respect, is in some respects, you're giving it away. And that may be your choice, and it's not my place to dictate policy to the municipality. But there is value to those services. And in the case of Smooth Rock Falls, once that camouflage with the non-taxation revenue went away, they discovered what the true cost of that value was, 1200 bucks a house. The other comment that I will make, and, and I'm not hoping this happens, but good times end. And listen, Sudbury is a nickel copper town. When my dad started with a contractor in 1974, there were 60,000 people working in the mines. Now there's 8,000 people working in the mines. Three years ago, I gave a presentation in Alberta, four years ago, about financial planning, financial sustainability. And your worship, I had a counselor stand up and say, I don't need to care about this because oil will always be high. I kid you not. And so I hope that the price of coal comes up. I hope that demand from China is strong. I hope that they continue to operate them under care and maintenance policies. Even if they're not operating, you still get the taxes. I swear on my mother, Your Worship. I hope that's the case. But the reality is this. If that doesn't become the case, what you have basically done is you've foregone the opportunity to charge a little bit more, to reflect the value that you're providing, to build up your reserves for the days when the mines are being taxed. And your community serviced or built for two coal mines, Manitowage in northwestern Ontario built for two copper mines. My father sank one of the shafts. They tore the last head frame down in 2001. They have no industrial assessment. City of Elliott Lake, founded in 1960 for uranium mining, in 2000, or sorry, in 1991, they closed every single mine. A community built for 30,000 people, they lost 460 million dollars of industrial assessment overnight. And the challenge that you have is, if you've got a water treatment plant built for 30,000 people, and you only have 10, you can't close a third down. And so, your worship, it's up to council's policy. My only comment is, is from a sustainability perspective, if you see the value of the service, you may charge a little more, just to be able to make sure that when times aren't good, you have the wherewithal to be able to adjust accordingly. And, and, and I will say, Council, you've been very successful in attempting to diversify your economy with the geopark and with the dinosaurs. I will tell you, I would imagine in summertime this must be God's country. So that's my perspective. now. The truth is, I'm getting in my car and going back to Ontario, so Trent isn't going to pillory me with mocks on the way back. <laughs> it's a comment to think about from a sustainability perspective, and it's exactly what this key theme is intended to identify. Thank you. The second point is, there has been progress made on your strategic plan, and the challenge that you have with reviews such as this is there's a tendency to focus on areas for improvement and not address areas where strong and so when we look at the municipality strategic plan and we appreciate it was adopted in 2015 so it's still early days but the type of stuff that you're working towards and you've already demonstrated success on is the type of stuff that we would normally hit on and it comes down to making sure that you can demonstrate good use of public dollars transparency accountability long-term planning and making sure that your municipality is moving in the direction that you want to. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you look at the concept of performance reviews to make sure that if you've got underperforming municipal employees, you can deal with them. That's something that we would normally address. You're already taking care of it. In terms of your capital policy from an infrastructure perspective, you're looking into that. Policy review, and we'll get into a little bit more. So. This is one of the things we wanted to highlight that we thought was positive and we wanted to bring to the attention because all too often it's easy to sit back and just lob bombs. The third area that we want to talk about is the differentiation between governance and operations. And I will tell you, Council, I have had this conversation in probably 30 municipalities. It's an issue that generally comes to the forefront. What we have heard during the review is that that line between governance, which is council's role, and operating 
which is factual, is starting to become more. What we've heard is that in certain cases, what we've seen is some staff have left because that blurring is causing them to be uncomfortable, is causing morale issues. This is what we've heard. And in the individual interviews, we can get your perspective on this as well. What we've seen elsewhere is this. Generally speaking, when councils move from governance to operations, it's because of a couple of different things. Either they don't trust staff. And if you don't trust staff, then what you do is you start to get into the weeds because you don't trust that they're going to do the job for you. We had a, municipal, a municipality change its code of conduct to allow the mayor to basically direct staff. And what that was is a case where they didn't trust the CAO. And my comment was, you have gone offside, the Municipal Act in Ontario, you've gone offside what's considered to be best practice for corporate governance for municipalities. And what you've done is you've taken the chicken way out. Because if you don't trust your CAO, replace your CAO. Don't work around the process. The other change that we see where this happens, and these are mutually exclusive, is when you have municipalities that get big disruptions from an economic perspective, from an environmental perspective, what happens, what you'll find is that you get members on council who want to make the benefit, who want to make the impact, and who want to make the change. And what that does is because they are eager to make the change, they cross the line between governance and operations. It's not necessarily intentional, and it's not necessarily a criticism, it's just that's the circumstance. The third thing that we find is that when you get a council that has successful business people on it, they have a tendency to view corporate governance in the municipal sector akin to how they manage their own businesses. And you can't fault them for that. And listen, I'm an office managing partner, which means I get into the weeds everywhere. But the challenge is, is the private sector and the public sector are different. And so from an attitudinal approach, you need to recognize that despite the need, despite the want, despite the urge, there are benefits to standing back and acting more in a governance role and not an operational role. This is a conversation we've had in a number of municipalities I've mentioned, and there's two things that we know. By crossing the line from governance to operations, you're going offside. Now, there's no penalty, there's no teeth associated with that, but the reality is, is you're offside what the intended role of council is, as defined by the province of British Columbia. The second thing that we know is if this goes on too far and if it goes on too long, what you will start to do is you will start to lose staff and you will not be able to replace them. And the reason why is because everybody will know why they are leaving and you will start to have a revolving door. The municipality that I mentioned where they changed their code of conduct has had three clerks or three corporate officers in eight months. And what they're finding is the ones they're getting now, I might as well bring my 19-year-old son and give him a job because they are not getting qualified candidates. I know that the municipality has received governance training in the past. I know from my discussions with your CAO that this aspect has been being addressed and in some respects is actually getting better. We mention it as a theme because we've seen it. We don't necessarily need to comment on this because council, you know your job. And staff knows your job and you've talked about this as well. We're not here to beat a horse, but the reality is your worship and council, nobody's paying us to lie. If we hear it, we bring it to the table. Uh, could you just give us an example on that? I, mean, I, I think you're totally on, on, on base of what, what you're talking about there. But can you just give us an example of where councillors are getting into the operational side of thing where we should be focusing on the government side? There's a couple of examples that are cited, or sorry, through you, Your Worship. There's a couple of examples that are actually cited in the report. Council's involvement in bringing new bylaw, and for, bylaw infractions forward to staff. Uh, input with respect to some of the marketing activities that are being undertaken by the municipality. Um, in some cases, council's involvement in construction projects, capital projects in terms of site selection, in terms of input on engineering plans. And, and we've heard a couple of instances, and this isn't critical, this is just the commentary, where council has actually said, sue the contract. You know, so these are, these are examples where some people will say, those are operational decisions that should be best left to staff. Now, 
I'm not saying abdicate responsibility for oversight. I'm not saying abdicate responsibility for direction. It's just what we've seen in some cases, Councillor, is the examples that have been cited to us, we would have corresponding to your staff. You're a little too into this. And, and the bylaw enforcement one is one that we have particular concerns about. And once again, I may be biased by Ontario, but municipalities generally want to adopt a reactive role to bylaw enforcement. And the reason why is because if your standard is proactive and something happens, they're going to say you were supposed to have seen this. So generally speaking, what you see most bylaw enforcement policies are, are response-based and response-based from the community, not from council. Now, how you approach them in terms of bringing in your fire department to do fire code inspections with building permits is up to you, but that's an example where it extends beyond just municipal relations between council and staff to, you know, if you're actively going out and chasing every bylaw enforcement issue or actively going out and chasing every building code infraction, some people might say that's your new service standard. And if you miss, then my comment's going to be, when you're actively pursuing this, you should have caught it. So now you're responsible. These are some of the examples that were quoted to us. And, and once again, Council, we can have this discussion now. It's probably better suited for the individual conversations. I'm curious to get your perspectives. Yeah. So the issue of personnel is something that we flagged and what we've done on this slide and in the report is we've talked about your population. Um, according to BC statistics, there were three people living in Cumber Ridge in 1981. I believe your worship, you may have actually been one of them. <laughs> so, yeah, I might have been. Uh, what you can see is that you've never hit your targeted population of 10,000. It doesn't mean that's the case, but what we have heard is in those periods of peak population when you, you were approaching 5,000, the competition for personnel became problematic and it became a challenge and we see it as well. Whenever there's major resource development, particularly in remote communities, what happens is the mines have a tendency to suck up everybody who's done the university. And after they're done that, they go after the college grads and then after they go that, they go after everybody else. And so when you look at it from a municipal perspective, right now you have the staff to do what you do recognizing that your service levels are up here. The concern that we have is while you're competitive from a compensation perspective against your peers, when it comes down to the mines reopening and that race for talent to come on, our concern is that you're going to lose staff and you're not going to be able to replace them. And Council, I want you to know this isn't just compensation. This isn't money. There's a whole bunch of factors that go into this, but the real suggestion that we've made in the report is right now you do not have formal succession plan and so what we've really said is that is the potential risk because what it allows it doesn't do <coughs> is it doesn't tell you who your next CA is it doesn't allow you to look at your candidates and say practically can they do the job or do they have gaps that we need to close and if they do need to close how do we get them there? recognizing that in a lot of cases, your best choices for succession are going to be your internal candidates, right? And so this is an area where you may have some potential exposure if the mines, when the mines restart, when you have staff departures, that type of stuff as well. It's not unique to municipalities. I know what the retirement profile in my office looks like. I have seven partners in Sudbury on Friday. I had a succession planning meeting with my senior managers. And I said, we're going to do a five-year succession plan to be able to get as many people up to the partner level as I can because when they start to retire, I want to be able to fill. My comment to them was, not everybody's making partner, but at the end of the day, if I choose to ignore this, then I do it at my own peril. And it's the race for talent and the competition for talent is pronounced in the municipal and public sectors. We've seen it. And what we know is that in remote communities, particularly in the north, it's particularly problematic to get them because the truth is, if I can be frank, nobody wants to come to Sudbury because it's too cold. 
Tumblr Ridge. Maybe. When we looked at your policy environment, we looked at it from the perspective of financial management. And what we've included in the report is a flowchart that covers what we call the planning, budgeting, and evaluation process. And it's the concept of saying, we would suggest from a best practices perspective that municipalities have a long-term financial plan, which then informs annual operating budgets, which then staff come back to council and the community and report on how you did. Based on how you did, you cycle through the process again. In support of this, there should be policies that are designed to help you to manage those steps. And when you look at financial policies, generally speaking, there's three things that you want to do. You want to make sure that you actually have a process for your budget. That specifically defines time frames because if you're ad hoc, then every budget cycle is going to be a different budget cycle. And the reality is, is from a budgeting perspective, at a certain point, time is of the essence. What you want to make sure of as well is when you're taking your budgeting, you're doing it consistently. The second thing that a strong policy environment gives you is it gives you protocols for how you make your decisions so that decisions are made consistent, so that you're not breaking precedent or establishing precedent when you have a decision, when you're contradicting yourselves. Where we see this the most, Council, comes down to reserve policy, and it comes down to grants to the community. And from a reserve policy perspective, Councils will turn around and say, I want to build reserves for this purpose, this purpose, this purpose, and then they don't like the tax increase, so they raid the reserves. You see it from a capital perspective, they need to keep the lights on so they fund the operating and they cut the capital. From a grants perspective, you establish a policy, a community group comes in, they don't quite fit it, and then council makes the decision to provide the grant anyways. That's your discretion, but the issue is, is by doing that, what you're doing is you're breaking trail and establishing precedents. And so because of that, if I'm in the wings, I'm going to go, you know what, now it's my turn to get my cash and you're smiling because you know exactly what I'm talking about. No question. The other thing is, is that it lays the groundwork for financial sustainability because you know that you've got the right financing for capital and you've got the right reserve and reserve policy management. So my municipality, Sudbury, in the 90s had a mayor by the name of Jim Gordon whose claim to fame was 10 years of 0% tax increase. Affordability. So the way you get that is you rate every reserve you have. So you empty the WSIB reserve, the workers' comp reserve, sorry, you empty the reserve for employee future benefits, you empty the firefighters reserve, and then when you run out of reserves, you go after capital. And so in the beginning of late 80s, early 90s, my municipality spent 27 million bucks in capital. In 2000, it spent four million. And what happened was you couldn't drive on the roads. And so when you're looking at long-term sustainability, strong policy environment allows you to say, these are the rules of the game. Now, it is up to council, and it's totally within council's purview to change your policies. That's what you do. You establish policy. But what it does is it provides a bit of a gut check where if you turn to your treasurer and you turn to your CAO and say, I want to have a 40% tax reduction, go pay the reserves to get it. In the absence of a reserve policy, that could very much happen. If you do have a reserve policy though, what it requires you to do is say you're offside the policy, let's consider whether the policy needs to change. One municipality, Elliott Lake, the one that lost the $460 million <coughs> assessment, decided one year that their taxes were too high. So they cut their budget by 20%. Sorry, they cut their tax levy by 20%. And the reason why is because they didn't have a tax budget policy that said, here's how we determine. I'm not saying you can't do this. What I'm saying is good paper makes good business. And a good policy environment helps you in your decision making because what it also allows you to do is to go back to the community and go back to grants and say, I'm sorry, this is the policy. This is what we're doing. 
And it's meaningful because your reserves are actually quite high. And I mentioned $27 million of reserves at the end of 2015. Your reserves work out to be just under $17,000 per household, which is also double the next municipality in the comparative. You have a lot of reserves. You've got it very well built up. So my question is, is do you actually have a policy to manage that $27 million pool of funds? I already know the answer, it's no. Would you keep $27 million in the bank if you didn't have a plan for it? No. It'd be nice to have that luxury. Sure. Um, there are aspects of your processes that we would consider to be subject to certain inefficiencies or risk exposure. And I, I want to make this very clear. There's efficiencies from a process perspective, then there's overall efficiencies. Generally speaking, where your costs are higher than other municipalities, we attribute that to your service levels. We think pound for pound, staff member for staff member, you're about as efficient as any of the other ones in the comparative group. So I don't want this being the same as saying, <coughs> We've got massive inefficiencies in our system. We can make it by cutting. We can make it by cutting out these efficiencies. We'll get real savings. If you're going to make serious cuts to your budget, it's going to be through service level reductions. I need to put that on the table. What I'm talking about here is how your processes work, and these are not necessarily cost issues. What they are is their capacity concerns. And so, in some cases, when we work through the system. We see duplication of work efforts. We see areas where your processes may not appropriately address your risk. We see instances where you're using manual processes as opposed to automated processes or technology. Um, we see some potential issues from an internal control list. So let me give you a couple of examples. This is your municipal work order process. And basically what happens is if I'm a resident, small writing, I know. Uh, you might be able to see this. <coughs> Jim Is that in Close. the handout anywhere? It's coming in a separate one. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. 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 Don't it appears that I cannot. This is on the PDF. It's not the PowerPoint. Let me see. Let me see if I can. I'll explain it to you basically. So. If I'm a resident of Tumbler Ridge and I have an issue, there's a dead animal on the street, logs fallen on the road, stop signs down, water main frozen, what happens? I call the district office. They record that in what's known as a record of concern book. So it's actually paper. And there's three copies to it. One copy is sent to the resident, one copy is sent to the respective department, and one copy is kept at the front desk. The copy that's sent to the department generally goes through inter-office mail. In some cases, there may be an email sent out if it's considered to be urgent. The department does the work, they sign the ROC, they return it to the office, they input it into the maze system, which is your financial slash municipal management system, and then you update the information in maze, you file it in with the registry. So you look at this and you go, what are the issues, Oscar? I said, okay, you're using manual pages to track customer requests. So the comment is, if I want to find out where that is, can I efficiently say, where am I with this issue? And some people will say, yeah, I just go through the book and I find it. But the issue is, is what if I'm standing in front of the resident right there? What if the person doesn't have the book? What if the book is actually lost? Right? What if three years from now I need to go back and prove that I did the work? Right? So what you find people are doing is they're actually automating their work on the processes. The second thing that you find is that when they assign the work and when they respond to the work, there's no prioritization and there's no response protocol. So there is no, here's a level one call that's required to be dealt with in two hours. Here's a level two call that's required to be dealt with in 12 hours. Here's a level three call that's required to be dealt in 24 hours. And here's a level four that I'll get to it when I get to it. There's none of that. Now, why is that important? 
It's not an inefficiency. It's not an excess cost. What it is, is it's customer service. And what it says is, is if I have this issue, I should expect a response by X. What it also is, is it's consistency. Every call of the same type should get the same priority and the same response time. You walk into a hospital emergency room, they have something called the Canadian Trauma Acuity Scale, C test, one to six. One, you gotta see a doctor, six, go home. Right? That concept of prioritization, that concept of response time, it's not an efficiency. This is the customer service example I was talking about. In terms of how you register for parks and recreation, you use a program called the MAX system, M-A-X-X. -X. A number of municipalities across Canada use it. Somebody comes in from a family, you need to register them as a family in the MAX system. Then you register them in a recreation program, they pay, you input the transaction into Max, you give them the receipt. <coughs> At the end of the day, you print out a report, you then post it into the Mays system, make the bank deposit, right? It flows. So how does this work? Where are the issues? This is an area where we're still going back and forth with your staff, but when I sign up for Parks and Recreation Program for my son, I'm required to sign a waiver of liability basically says by participating I accept risks I'm not going to sue my municipality buy a ski lift ticket it's on the back you don't do that and so what that means is if my son Matthew comes here and slips and falls on the curling rink and breaks his head open you don't have a liability of waiver protection in some respects there's some debate as to whether it actually helps you or not my only comment is every jurisdiction I've been to requires this to be signed. Listen, I've skied in Kelowna, it's on the back of my <coughs> The second thing that you find is that when you produce your cash receipts report, in the MAX system, you're actually allowed to override transactions. And what that means is, is Councillor Scott can come in and pay for a service, and then what I could do afterwards is I could wipe her transaction and take her cash and nobody's running the exception report to see that that's happening. Is it happening? Probably not. I hope not, but I'm more concerned with what could happen as opposed to what does happen. The third area is there's a duplication here. You key the information into Max and you key the information into Maze. And so what you're doing, council, is you're paying a staff member to key the same data twice. Now. Are you going to save a gajillion dollars by integrating? No, but you're going to tighten the internal controls and you're going to create the capacity for the person to do something else. And I'll give you the benefit of my example. Everybody tells me, oh, it only takes five minutes. And we heard that here. Nothing takes five minutes. And even if it takes four minutes times 250 working days, you know, what other five-minute examples do you have? Council, I want to make this very clear. A couple of points. I can walk into any municipality and find this, both of what I've talked about, work orders and this, and then payroll and accounts payable. This is not unique to you. Okay, so I don't want you or I don't want the people watching to come out with the perception that your staff don't know what they're doing or are intentionally doing this. The reason why this happens is because municipalities develop over time. And you've been around for 35 years. And in those 35 years, you bolted stuff on. And in a lot of cases, because you're bolting stuff on, it's almost like Legos. It gets blocky and goes in different directions, and it doesn't coordinate as well as it could. The third thing is, is sometimes you buy a system at a certain point in time, and you outgrow the system. And what I would suggest to you is a lot of what we've seen from a process perspective doesn't have to do with your staff. It has to do with the maze system. And no offense to the maze system, because you know, I can find other systems, the Nelson system in Ontario, for example, where this is an issue. So I don't want this scene as being critical on your staff. I don't want this scene as being reflective of their performance. The reality is this. 
people that we talk to, to put these together, take an exceptional level of pride in what they do. Your finance department treats it like it's their own money, which means they reconcile and they control and they make sure everything's accounted for. This is more a question of the tools that your staff have and how you integrate the tools than the performance of your staff themselves. So it's almost unfair to call this an inefficiency. But at the end of the day, what you can see or what we've tried to demonstrate is there is potential exposure to internal control risk, there's potential exposure to litigation risk, there's duplication of work efforts, and in some cases there's limitation from a customer service perspective. Like I said, I can go anywhere in finance. We did a municipality called Oro Medante, which is just north of Toronto, 47 points in their public works department. So this is not unique, and this isn't a criticism of your staff. I want to make that very clear. We know that infrastructure investment is going to be an emerging need for your district. And, and the truth is, people would look at me like I have two heads for saying that. Because the reality is, your infrastructure is in incredible shape. Your roads are in good shape. You don't have a lot of water main breaks. Your trails are paved as opposed to gravel. Your municipal facilities are beautiful. But at the end of the day, what we know is this. Because of the nature of the tax system, as we've discussed, you've built up fairly healthy levels of reserves. You're in a good position to sustain your infrastructure. What we know as well as part of your long-term financial plans, you identify your capital funding and your capital needs. That's great. In some cases, you may want to be a little more specific. But at the end of the day, the concern that we have is this municipality was laid down in 1981, 1982. You're halfway through your useful. And what that means is you're getting to the point where if you haven't started spending money, you're going to have to. And we know that the municipality is undertaking the development of an asset management plan. That is something that we strongly encourage. What it, I would suggest to you, though, is this. This is an excerpt from an asset management plan that we prepare. And what this talks about is one kilometer of road, paved road. It's an urban road, so it's a little more traffic than you're involved. And what the chart does on the left-hand side is it actually shows the maintenance cycle. And what it demonstrates, Council, is you can't put a piece of pavement down in 1981 and ignore it until it reaches its engineered useful life in 2041. Every five years, you're supposed to do something to that road. And what you find is that in the middle of its useful life, at say 30 years, there's a rehab that's required. So 1981 plus 30 years, 2000. And what you find is the graph on the right hand side attempts to reflect that. The blue bars that you see, and this is actually in the document, every time you see a blue bar, that's a point in time where you're supposed to be spending money on your infrastructure, according to the engineers. The red line is the cumulative cost of taking care of that. Now, this is not you. This is not your infrastructure. This is not your local conditions. These are not your costs. But the concept is the same. You can't put pavement down and not do something to it for 60 years. You can't put pipes in the ground and not do something to them for 80 years. You can't build a community complex and say, I'm going to ignore it for 50 years. Windows, flooring, HVAC systems, roofs, parking lots, that type of stuff. And so what we know is that we anticipate that your infrastructure investments can become more pronounced. We anticipate that you're going to need to have the planning tools and policy tools that you don't currently have to be able to appropriately manage. Because otherwise, what you're doing is you're putting pavement down for the sake of putting pavement down. We talked about long-term forecasting. I love your long-term financial plan. I think it is very well done. I think it demonstrates a level of sophistication that goes beyond what people would normally expect from communities of your size. Um, 
I actually think it's I think it's best practice. And so more than anything else, this is just a plug to say, you know, after everything else, you are doing a lot of things right, and this is one of them. I like the fact that you've got a five-year forecast that's built into play that looks at your operating costs. I love your taxation analysis. If I am a resident of the community, I could go onto your website and everything I've talked about, your worship about that residential, non-residential shift, I could find on your site. I didn't do the analysis, your staff did. We've talked about how you're doing capital planning and capital forecasting. This is an example of it where you break it down by project, break it down by year, break it down by department. I think from a financial planning perspective, for municipalities, your service, <coughs> what you do is among the best that I've ever seen. And I've seen a lot. Um, the last point that I want to make from a key themes perspective is we talked about the service levels. The reality is, is there are non-core services that you can cut if you wish to. And this comes down to one of those early deliverables about differentiating your services between legislative versus enabling. We've actually broken them down into three categories. Legislated services or required services. You're not required to have somebody who cleans your town hall, but by virtue of being a municipality, you have to have somebody who cleans your town hall. You do have to have a corporate officer. You do need to take care of the roads. There are services that are expected. And so while you're not necessarily required to have an arena, um, we would suggest that in Canada, you need an arena. And then there are those services that are enabled. What you will find is that roughly 85% of your budget falls into those first two categories, which means while you can still reduce the costs over 85% of your budget, you need to recognize that either as a result of legislation, community expectations, or the practical realities of running a municipality, you're going to have to spend that money. You can tweak it, but you're going to have to spend it. Your pure discretionary is about one and a half million dollars per year. Includes the golf course, grant and aid and fee for service, and other discretionaries as well. I'm going to caution you, the golf course numbers are unfair because you spend $450,000 a year on the golf course, but you make about $300,000 a year. So your true cost is about $150,000. The question that you have to ask yourself is, should you be using $150,000 of taxpayers' money to operate? <coughs> so there are opportunities that we've identified we've broken them into two categories there are those opportunities that we suggest are strategic level and a strategic level opportunity has something that has to do that fundamentally changes the service or how you fund a service and requires council approval there are those opportunities that we consider to be operational in nature where your CAO and the staff should be doing it in the normal course of business. This, operational. Tax policy, strategic. And so in the report, we've identified 22 opportunities. In the interest of time, I'm just going to refer to the table that's in the executive summary where we've broken them down. They cover a range of things, including use of technology, increases in user fees, looking at potentially divesting services, what have you. When we have the individual interviews, we will go through these on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And the intention is to make sure that you understand exactly why you've suggested it, understand exactly what the opportunity entails. What we find is that if we don't spend the time, and this is a lesson that we learned early in the game, is that if we don't spend the time to make sure that council truly understands the opportunity and has the ability to exhaust all of their questions, then you're going to have a very difficult time making a decision because in the absence of knowing for sure, you're going to defer. And what you're going to do is you're going to go through the list and you're not going to pick anything and you're going to go, come on guys, we got to pick something and it's going to get increasingly frustrated. So we will take the time to spend with you to make sure that you understand exactly what we're saying. We've also provided an implementation framework, and one of the things that my experience has demonstrated, Council, and take this for what it's worth, 
where you will get barbecued in this process is by not communicating with your residents. I'm sorry, that's a poor choice of words. But where council gets criticized, if somebody comes up and gets paid taxpayer dollars to provide you with a list of things you should consider, and it goes on a shelf somewhere and doesn't come up. And so what we strongly suggest you do as part of the implementation framework is develop a communication strategy and take a phased approach. You need to figure out which ones you're going to do and which ones you're not going to do and why. In certain cases, particularly for municipalities that get amalgamated or annexed, they have too many fire stations. So what we sometimes we'll do is we'll say, you don't need this fire station, you should close it. And so what we suggest to council is if you don't agree with us, that's fine. Explain it to your residents. What we suggest is that you establish the time frames for the implementation and reporting. This is 60 pages. The appendices are going to be another 60 pages. It's going to take you time to put these in. Some of these you're not going to do for a year or two or three. But the issue is, is if you can tell your residents, this is the process and this is how we're going to stage this, and this is when we're going to report, then they know you're on top of this. Right? You may choose to ignore everything we've said, and that's fine. I don't particularly care what your answer to this is. What I want to do is I want to ask you the question. <laughs> then you can then provide that answer and say, we don't want to cut this service because we think it's important to have a golf course because we know we're a remote community we have limited services right now. We don't think we can get a private sector operator. We need something to entertain the residents. That's why we've got a golf course. I buy that. If I buy that, generally speaking, the residents may as well. Implementation planning should be the bailiwick of the CAO. Once again, governance, operation, provide the direction, let your CAO take the task forward to come up with the implementation planning and on a periodic basis and we would suggest quarterly have your CAO stand in front of this room and say here's where we are. A report card. Here's the opportunities, here's the ones that are yes, here's the ones that are no, here's the progress on the ones that are yes. Are they implemented? Are they in the planning stage? Do we have a plan B? That type of stuff because people will want to see that you're moving on to this. If you were going to shelve this plan, you should have told me three months ago that I would have just mailed it in and we'd be done, right? And so what we've done, and it's a little complicated, but there's a table that we've actually suggested. Top to bottom is the priority. Low, medium, high. Left to right is the time frame, near term versus long term. These are our suggestions. At the end of the day, it's up to the municipality. So, council, if I may, I just want to uh, leave you with some points. And, and I will apologize if I'm so boxy here. But the first comment that I want to make is I want to go back to the comment and reiterate the fact that what you do has value. And the concern that we have is we see, or I have seen in other communities, what I call a race to the ball. And they say our average tax per household is a thousand bucks. The guys next door are 700. We need to be at 600. And what that does is that compromises services and service levels in response to what's perceived to be an affordability concern that I would suggest to you in this community doesn't exist. So we will just caution you this. You can tweak your operations. You can find some efficiencies by changing some of the processes. Recognizing that from a comparison perspective and a process perspective, there's already efficiencies that are being demonstrated. This isn't what we would consider to be a fat organization. Recognize that if you're trying to make significant change to your municipal levy, it's going to require a service. The second point that I would make is how you manage your capital. We would characterize your approach as being run to failure. I buy a piece of equipment, I drive it till it fails. What you will find is that that is ultimately more expensive than actually spending money to replace the vehicle before the repairs start. We have been advised by your staff that in some cases you have spent upwards of twenty to 25000 bucks on repairs for major equipment, 
And I would suggest to you, and one of the opportunities is, there's a point where it's cheaper to replace than repair. So run to failure strategies are attractive because you save the capital, but the true cost of that means you have higher operating costs than you need to. Um, I will tell you that in my experience, <coughs> if I go to taxpayers and I say I need a 2% increase to fund salaries, they're going to look at me like the English looking at Joan of Arc. If I say I need 2% to make sure that my roads are paved and that my water system infrastructure is up to date, they're generally more receptive to capital. So if you are looking at capital financing from a communications perspective, we strongly suggest you call it a capital levy. And I don't know the nuances of the BC Tax Act, but if you can separate it from operating and have a policy that specifically restricts it to capital, what you will find is generally speaking, my experience has been, they're more receptive to pay for that. Um, as I mentioned, good times always end. And I can appreciate that we don't want that to be the case, and I, I swear, I hope that's not the case, but I remember when nickel was 21 bucks a pound, <coughs> and now it's four. I remember when oil was 114 bucks a barrel. It got down to 40. So at, so at the end of the day, You've been fortunate in terms of your situation and your circumstances, and that allows you just recognize that at some point in time, things can change. Um, and the last point that I would make is you really do need to trust your staff. And I, and I don't want to be sentimental here. It is very clear to us, Council, that you have some very good people that work for you. Um, good from a skills perspective, but also from a dedication perspective. Your staff take their jobs seriously. And I don't want to make that a blanket comment. The ones we've interacted with, I thought your deputy treasurer was going to kill me. Because when we went through the processing, you could tell she was taking it personally. And I didn't want to take it personally. And I want to actually say this because I probably owe her an apology. Because at the end of the day, the only way you find these things is to push. And it is very clear to us, she takes great pride in her job. She considers it her ultimate goal to make sure that there's appropriate stewardship over financial funds. Um, I get that from other members of your management team. I get that from your CAO. You have a good pool of people that work for you, so trust them. And what you will find is that provide them with the direction, let them come back to you, monitor them, make sure they report, don't give them too much rope. But at the end of the day, you've got a good team here. <coughs> so, your worship, members of council, that concludes my presentation. If there are any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them at this time. Well, thank, thank you very much. This has been one of the best presentations that I've been a part of, and I've been around here for a long time. Thank you. It's uh, pretty enlightening. And, uh, council, do you have uh, any questions? Yeah, I know. I just wanted to say the same thing. I'm new to this. A lot of these guys have been here for a long time. This is our second year into it. And in the two years that I've been here, this is the most informative and best presented thing that I could understand while we were in here. And uh, I thank you guys for putting it together. Very, very well done. And I look forward to the continued steps that we're going into. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Um, just on the different, uh, different, I don't know, different accounts, if that's the right way to put it. Because, uh, and you just brought it up there, um, money aside for capital uh, on uh, repairs, others for, you know, for, for a lot of different things. Um, once upon a time, I think we used to do that, but we're warned against that exact thing. In fact, it was almost like it was, uh, um, I guess, as when, when it came time to audit, that was kind of frowned against. Now, is there something different between BC and Ontario? Um. Because I, I can see that working a lot better, is it? but uh, you don't do that. Through you, your worship, you have reserves on your financial statements now. And you have reserve funds on your financial statements now. Water sewer. Sorry? Water sewer, which is, yeah. which is mandatory. Yeah. So the, the, concept, the concept that we have is, and what we've suggested is this. You have $27 million. You have $27 million of reserves. Part of it is sitting for water and sewer, and part of it is just general. Right? And so what you are going to find is as you move through life cycle replacement and improvements, you're going to need pockets of money for certain things. 
things. And let me give you the best example. Um, you need to buy a fire truck. Let's say for argument's sake, fire trucks last 10 years. They don't, but let's say they do. And they cost 500,000 bucks. So what you could do is you could wait till year 10 and spend $500,000. Or what you could do is you could put $50,000 aside every year for 10 years so that you have $500,000. That's the concept of reserve policy in line with capital plan. And what we would suggest right now, counselor, is that's an area where you probably want to build some more policies around it. And, and admittedly, counselors, not a lot of people have these policies. You know, and so the question that I always get, because when I'm not doing this, I audit municipalities and hospitals, and I go into a council meeting, I say, you have this much in reserve, and the question that I ultimately get from a mayor or a councillor is, do we have enough? Do we have too much? Right? And so what reserve policy does helps you to say, you need a reserve for this, here's the maximum, here's the minimum, and here's the rules for using it. And for that planning. Now, that is internal policy as opposed to financial reporting. The reality is your audited financial statements, I could do because your basis of accounting is national, not provincial. So the rules are the rules. You're allowed to have reserves. You've got a note for it as well. What I, what I would suggest, and I'm not gonna comment on past advice you may have received. Good policy makes good business. <coughs> 27 million bucks is a lot of money and it's going up. What I would suggest is if you had a plan for it, from a municipality perspective, from a sustainability perspective, you'd be further off. Okay, but just for the record, I, I agree with you 100%. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, um, I'm looking forward to seeing the uh, implementation plan and the, the prioritization of everything. And I, I love timelines. Um, what is the timeline of when we do the one-on-one -on -one, um, meetings with you? And when is the final report going to be issued? Through you, Your Worship, we had a discussion with your CAO about whether those go before Christmas or after Christmas. Um, so my question is, is, would you rather them go before Christmas or after Christmas? Can I be very honest with you? I'm supposed to be on holidays starting Friday. Okay. I would much prefer first week of January, and what that will allow you to do is take time, digest this report, digest the appendices that are coming out, have a good read of it, and then let's reconvene in the new year. My hope is by the end of middle to end of January, once we have the council feedback, we'll be issuing our report. And then how long are these one-on-one -on -one meetings? Like, should we plan an hour, two-hour session, or? Through you, Your Worship, we typically will do an hour and a half from a scheduling perspective, and we will block half an hour in between. So that way we can go up to two hours. And if we haven't gotten it done in two hours, then we'll reconvene. Okay. And, and Councillor, my, my commitment to you is very clear. We will take the time that it takes to make sure that you Thank you. Yeah, so, so just a, an example here. I know we're, we're talking about replacing a bunch of equipment here this year in this upcoming budget. And uh, Mayor McPherson pointed out that we have 1.7 million in reserves to do this equipment that we want to do. And we were told the cost right now I think is 1.6 million. So is that something that's, you know, that you, that you just say, yeah, let's go ahead and spend that 1.6 million because we got 1.7 in reserve. That doesn't leave you anything in are really right leaves you hundred thousand what is that well through you your worship when you look at fleet replacement particularly what you should have is and I'm sure you have an inventory of your vehicles what year you buy them for or what year you buy them and what's the use for them and so what you basically can do is over a 10-year period you can plot it out and I'll tell you right now if you graph it it's going to look like this so what you typically do is you fund it to be smooth Never spend the money just because you have the money, right? But if that line says, I'm due for 1.6 million this year, then spend 1.6. Recognizing that next year, you're gonna have to put money back in the reserve in order to be able to fund future flows. What's more important, or, or what's equally important, isn't necessarily saying, how much am I gonna spend, but it's also what you buy. So, for example, some municipalities are introducing tandem trucks to their winter maintenance fleets. And the reason why is because they could use them to haul gravel in the summertime. 
as opposed to a pure snow plow that you park from April to October. And so it's not necessarily what you buy, it's also <coughs> recognizing that do you buy the same thing? The other thing that's in the report is the concept of alternate procurement. And there's an opportunity there that we've said, you know, if you've got something that is highly seasonal in nature, that you only use certain months, street sweepers, or you only use a certain number of hours in the wintertime, graders, should you be looking at renting? Should you be looking at leasing? If you have pickup trucks that you're only using for 1,000 kilometers a month, should you be looking at leasing versus buying? Should you be looking at buying versus leasing? So it's alternate procurement. And so it's not just the quantum of the dollars. It's what you buy and do you buy the same thing. And it's also how do I acquire it? And those, those all feed together. And what that really requires, Council, is an asset management plan and a fleet management plan that your staff are putting together that we understand. So you're on the road to it. Once again, I think it's an oversimplification to say, I got a million seven, so let's buy a million six worth of stuff. Do you actually need to buy it? Are you buying the right stuff? Are you procuring in the right approach? And these are questions that when we've had discussions with your public works director, he was very alive to these comments. And you have looked at leasing in the past and that type of stuff. Thanks. Um, with infrastructure, should we be focusing on the sewer and water and pavement and that sort of stuff? Like to me, that's um, what the infrastructure actually is to provide services, or is it the buildings as well as equipment? Through you, Your Worship, if there's if there's one sin that I consider municipalities to be guilty of is. They like the color black. And so what that means is they like pavement. So they will pave gravel roads and they will have capital programs that are very road centric, where it's all about the roads and they forget about everything else. Um, and that's problematic because if I were to turn around and walk out there and ask 10 people who are pulling six year olds by the hand what the most important asset is, they're not going to say founders. They're going to talk about your colleagues. Right? So what you find is that facilities play an important part. They oftentimes get left behind in the mix because they're not roads, water, and sewer, the big ticket items. What I would suggest, Councillor, is, and this once again gets back to your asset management plan, one of the things that you may want to consider is the concept of establishing capital offerings. And this comes down to your capital funding. Where you say, we're going to raise X million dollars a year in capital. Call it a million bucks for rounding sake. 40% for roads, 30% for facilities, 20% for fleet, playground equipment, what have you. And then inside of those envelopes, your managers have the ability to prioritize because the reality is a major road reconstruction project with a water and sewer project will eat all of your capital. From a federal funding perspective, and I don't know the provincial gas, but gas tax, you can't buy rolling stock with gas tax. Right? You buy pavement with it. So I would suggest that you take a balanced approach. <laughs> Because people are going to notice if the quality of your infrastructure and your building stock goes down. You know, people are also going to know if the roads are bad, so it comes down to the sufficiency. <coughs> the other comment that I will make is this. The one thing that you need to be very cognizant of when you're developing your capital plan, and I'm saying this for the sake of just saying it because I know your staff know this, is you need to treat them as integrated assets. So if you're going to tear up a road, do you go after the pipes? Because the risk that you have is that you fix a road and then five years later the pipe lets go and then you're digging up all of that pavement to get to it. Because in order to get to a pipe, you got to get to a road. The other concept is, and it comes down to the theory of manholes. I've got a sewer pipe, I've got a tunnel, and there's the manhole that pops out. If I fix the road network, that's fine. But if my sewers aren't repaired at the same time, the manhole will actually separate from the pipe and it'll start to move up and down. And when it moves up and down because of frost heat, I'm pretty sure you get frost. The 
pavement will start to go up and down as well. And then you've compromised your road network. So you need to take it from an integrated approach. Some municipalities, particularly with limited funds, will only fix roads based on the pipes that are underground. The pipe replacement policy will drive their road policy. So balanced approach, integrated approach. You guys are doing an asset management plan. I know you're going to cover all of this. Yeah, we've discussed all of that. And uh, does who does help craft the policies? Like if we're lacking in some of the policies? We're actually providing suggested policies to our staff. Now, they're not our policies. Right. They're your policies. What they are is they're a framework. Thank you. Um, thanks. When you say uh, get asked by, by the mayor, uh, he's talking about our reserves too much, too little. That is, I've asked that to a lot of people. I never have got a straight answer. But, you know, and when you talk about reserves, I like the other day there when I saw that they were asking for 1.4, I think. I don't know, I remember. But a uh, million for, to replace a bunch of equipment. Uh, my first question was, <laughs> uh, Jordan's office, there no <coughs> planning around here or what? You know, <laughs> and, it's, and it, there is, there is there's 1.7 in reserve. Uh, so when we talk about 27 million, I would like that to be, that's, the reserve should be off of that. Because the reserves are put away for, for a reason. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if, if we got 1.7 million for vehicles or equipment, that should be off of that twenty-seven million. That shouldn't even be talked about yeah. in the same sense. So worse if it's all it's all part of the same number. You're correct. So the yeah. water and wastewater <clears throat> funds and, and the reserves that you have now are in place. The uh, the comment that I will make to you, and it's the same comment I make to all of my municipalities. I don't care who you are. You don't have enough in reserves. And I will bet you a thousand bucks that that's the case. I've heard horror stories from some of your municipalities. Uh, and they're not over that. so I, I think we can learn by yeah. what we see. Your Worship, I had a client who had to turn down a grant. And the reason why they had to turn down an infrastructure grant is because they couldn't come up with their share because their mayor was involved in a race to the bottom. Well, thank you. Um, any other questions from Council? I think we're finished that, so that's... Uh, going to take us to closed meeting. Oh, you get the recommendation there. Let me just get